Hello, Discovery Learners. It is I, Teacher Liz, here, your host once more for this episode of Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program. It's Monday, so of course I have new observances, history lessons, animals and plants to see, a new place to explore, and of course some Spanish words to learn. And be sure you're logging in for the Zoom sessions provided to you every day by the Discovery Educational Team. So let's not delay anymore. Let's start the show. And now for our daily observances. Our first observance for today is International Women's Day. International Women's Day on March 8th each year celebrates the social, economic, and political achievements of women all around the world. The day also brings international awareness to gender parity. According to World Economic Forum, global gender equality is estimated to achieve by 2133. Gender equality is the equal access to the same rights and opportunities regardless of the gender. These rights and opportunities include health care, education, employment, economic gain, pay, protection under the law, right to vote, and freedom from violence. So how do we observe International Women's Day? Well, around the world, organizations, communities, and individuals organize events focused on the mission of on gender parity, celebrating the achievements of women worldwide and education. You can attend a lecture, seminar, or festival, organize an event, speak, or perform at a local fundraiser, participate in a march for women's equal rights, learn more about women who paved the way for many of the rights and freedoms we have today, become involved in your local state, or national political system and invite others to join with you including other women even sons brothers sisters and daughters and by the way you don't have to be a woman to observe this day so how do you plan on observing international women's day go ahead and let us know in the comment section below our next observance is a sweet and salty one. It's National Peanut Cluster Day. March 8th is Peanut Cluster Day. Melted chocolate mixed with peanuts make a perfect combination for sweet and salty deliciousness. Two things had to happen for the peanut cluster to even exist. First, a method had to be invented for the cocoa bean to be processed and transformed into what we know as chocolate. That process wasn't widely used until about late 1890s. And just about the same time, the second extraordinary thing happened. Agriculture found a way to grow peanut and bring it to the public with steel tools and steam power. It didn't take long for confectionaries to add now readily available peanuts to melted chocolate. The sheer simplicity of the salty peanuts added to sweetened chocolate is a mouth-watering temptation few can resist, even today. Candy makers find them to be a popular addition to cookie tins and other holiday baskets. Their simplicity allows bakers to easily round out any cookie bar and tray. They also quickly satisfy a snack craving without much effort at all. So how do we observe Peanut Cluster Day? Well, peanut clusters are an easy to make snack that can be ready in just a few minutes. Melt the chocolate, add the peanuts, and stir them together. Drop them by the spoonfuls into a cluster on wax paper or foil. Let them harden, then enjoy. Or you could pause here and write down the recipe and instructions so you can make peanut clusters at home. So do you like peanut clusters? Do you like peanuts and chocolate? I do. My favorite candy is Reese's. What's yours? Are you going to try some today? Go ahead and let us know in the comment section below. Our last observance for today is National Proofreading Day. Every year on March 8th, National Proofreading Day highlights the importance of proofreading our written work. The day also allows those who enjoy proofreading to gently correct others. However, if invented to proofread others' work, constructive criticism is usually welcome. The day promotes mistake-free writing. Carefully review all your letters and documentations to make a positive and professional impression. When proofreading, it sometimes helps to have a few tips handy to catch mistakes that are often overlooked. Use several of them and mix them up from time to time for the most effective proofreading. One is walk away. 
proofread after an article, important email, or chapter it has time to set and you're reading it with fresh eyes. Next, do not disturb. Remove all distractions, including phones, other deadlines, traffic noise, and interruptions. Three, learn your habits. Keep a list of your routine errors and look for those first. Four, turn off autocorrect. When you use Strictly as a tool, autocorrect can be helpful. Over time, we become relied upon it. In texts, emails, it can overcorrect our messages, creating havoc. When you're uncertain of a spelling of a word, so many other reliable and efficient tools are available. Next, read it out loud. We catch different errors when we read aloud than when we read by sight alone. So how do we observe National Proofreading Day? Share your tips and tricks for proofreading. Other ways to participate may include take a course on proofreading and challenge yourself to accept constructive criticism. I tend to write a lot of reports and even writing words in these videos. There are times where I do not proofread my own work and mistakes happen. But if you usually catch other people's errors, maybe this holiday, it's okay to let them slide. <laughs> So how do you plan on observing this one? Go ahead and let us know in the comment section below. On this day in history. Today in 1987, the A-Team last aired on NBC TV after four years. The A-Team is an American action adventure television series that ran on NBC from 1983 to 1987 and it was about former members of a fictitious United States Army Special Forces unit. The members, after being court-martialed for a crime they did not commit, escaped from military prison, and while still on the run, worked as soldiers of fortune. The series was created by Stephen J. Cannell and Frank Lupo. A feature film based on the series was released by 20th Century Fox in 2010. The fifth and final season of the action-adventure TV series The A-Team premiered in the United States on NBC on September 26, 1986 and concluded on March 8, 1987, consisting of 13 episodes. Have you seen The A-Team? Do you like that show? Let me know in the comment section below. Wow, isn't history awesome? Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure born today is Mickey Dolenz. Born March 8, 1945 in Los Angeles, California. This American actor and musician is best well known for his time drumming and singing for the 1960s rock band The Monkees. The group rose to fame on the TV series The Monkees and went on to release a number of hits including Train to Clarksville and Daydream Believer. Before he was famous, he started a children's show called Circus Boy. He is also able to play the drums right-handed and left-footed. He turns 76 years old today. Happy birthday, Mickey! Our next notable figure born today is Cameron Mannheim. Born March 8, 1961 in Caldwell, New Jersey. This American Emmy Award winning actress known for her role as the attorney Eleanor Frutt on the series The Practice. She also appeared on the show Ghost Whisperer. Before she was famous, she worked at a hospital as a sign language interpreter. She also won a Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Drama Series for her role in The Practice. She turns 60 years old today. Wow! Happy birthday, Cameron! Another notable figure born today is Kenny Smith. Born March 8, 1965 in New York City, New York. This American basketball player is a point guard known as the Jet, who won back-to-back -back NBA titles with the Houston Rockets in the mid-1990s. He later became an analyst for TNT's Inside the NBA after retirement. Before he was famous, he played basketball under the legendary coach Dean Smith at North Carolina. He turns 56 years old today. Happy birthday, Kenny. And for our last little figure born today is Freddie Prince Jr. 
Born March 8, 1976 in Los Angeles, California. This American actor who became known for his leading roles in movies such as She's All That, I Know What You Did Last Summer, I Still Know What You Did Last Summer, and Summer Cats. <laughs> Before he was famous falling in the footsteps of his father, he moved to Los Angeles to pursue an acting career after graduating college. He debuted as Joey Boast in the 1996 film to Jillian on her 37th birthday. But you all may remember him from the live adaptation of Scooby-Doo. He turns 45 years old today. Happy birthday, Freddy. Happy birthday, everyone. Come along as we take a journey to the place of the week. This week we are traveling to Japan. And do you hear that song in the background, Discovery Learners? Well, of course, it's the Japanese national anthem. Now let's take a closer look at the flag. This nation's flag consists of a white field bearing a central red disc. The red disc is said to represent the sun. The white field represents the purity of everyone's hearts within the nation. The current iteration of the flag has been in use since August 13, 1999. Now let's go ahead and learn a little bit more about Japan. Japan is an island country laying off the east coast of Asia. It is bounded to the west by the Sea of Japan, which separates it from the eastern shores of South and North Korea and southeastern Serbia, also known as Russia, to the north by La Peru Strait, separating it from Russian-held Sakhalin Island, to the east and south by the Pacific, and to the southwest by the East China Sea, which separates it from China. Japan's official name is Nippon, N-I-P-P-O-N. Its form of government is a constitutional monarchy with a national diet consisting of two legislative houses, the House of Counselors and the House of Representatives. Its head of state is an emperor and a prime minister. The capital of Japan is Tokyo. The most widely spoken language in Japan is Japanese followed closely second by English. And surprisingly, the third most popular language spoken in Japan is Korean. And the most popular religion in Japan is Shinto, followed by Buddhism, with Christianity finishing off the list. Japan's main monetary unit is the yen. 108 yen equals one US dollar. Japan's current population is 125,994,000 people. Japan has a total area of 145,898 square miles. That is around the same size of the U.S. state of California. Japan's main and number one exports are vehicles, machinery, and manufactured goods. And its main money-making industries are, of course, automotive, electronic equipment, metals, textiles, processed foods, entertainment, and tourism. Wow, Japan seems like a really neat place. I would love to visit Japan. Now, Japan is one of those countries I think most of the teachers have a lot of knowledge of. So be sure to stay tuned all week to every episode of Ability to Learn as we teach you more about Japan. Here is the animal of the day. Hey Discovery Learners, today's animal is the cicada. The cicada is a type of bug. There are around 25,000 different cicadas that can be found on every continent except for Antarctica. Cicadas prefer temperate, tropical climates. They can be found on beaches, forests, wetlands, deserts, alpine areas, fields, and even in cities. Cicadas are a part of the human diet in Asia, Africa, and South America. The shell of the cicada are used in traditional Chinese medicine. Despite that, cicadas are still widespread and numerous. 
They are not on the endangered species list at all. They are quite prolific. Cicadas can reach up to 3 inches in length. They have dark colored bodies with green markings. Cicada have 2 large red eyes on the side of their head and 3 small eyes on the top of their head. They have short antennae in the front with 2 pairs of transparent wings. Cicadas spend most of their life underground. Cicadas are herbivores, that means they eat plants. Their diet is based on juices extracted from the root and stems of all the plants they eat. Cicadas use straw-like mouths to extract the fluid from the plants. They can produce significant damage on trees, shrubs, and crops. The name cicada means tree cricket in Latin. The name refers to the loud cricket-like noise cicadas produce during the summertime days. Cicadas are one of the loudest insects on the planet. They produce the sound up to 120 decibels, louder than a rock concert, that can be heard over half a mile away. Male cicadas use timbals to produce sound. The timbals are part of the exoskeleton. They are located on the belly. Males produce two types of sound, one to attract females and the other to repel predators. The natural predator of cicadas are rodents, moles, squirrels, birds, lizards, spiders, killer wasps, and even fish. There are two types of cicadas, annual and periodical. The annual cicadas can be seen every year or every second year from July to August. Periodical cicadas can be seen every 13 to 17 years during May and early June. Periodical cicadas live as juveniles under the ground more than 10 years. After 13 or 17 years, they start to produce hormones which trigger the transformation into adulthood. They can be found only in the eastern parts of North America. The adult cicada can survive from 4 to 6 weeks. Waiting 10 to 13 years to be adult only to make it 4 to 6 weeks is very strange. But the cicada bug is kind of strange. Did you learn anything new about them? I didn't know there was two different types. I only knew about the ones that are 13 to 17 years old. Well, let us know in the comment section below if you learned something new about the cicada. The plant of the day. Today's plant of the day is the wisteria. Wisteria is deciduous vine that belongs to the pea family. There were 10 species of wisteria that originated from eastern parts of the USA and Asia, such as Korea, China, and Japan. Wisteria can be found on the edges of forests, in ditches and areas near the roads. It grows in deep, fertile, loomy, well-drained soil in areas that provide plenty of sun. It somewhat tolerates partial shade. People cultivate wisteria for ornamental purposes. Here are some interesting wisteria facts. Wisteria is woody vine that can reach up to 65 feet in height and 32 feet in width. It has a smooth or hairy gray, brown, or reddish colored stem which twines around nearby trees, shrubs, and various man-made structures. Wisteria has compound leaves made of 9 to 19 elliptical or oblong leaflets with wavy edges. Leaves are dark green colored and alternately arranged on the branches. Wisteria produces pink, white, purple, or blue colored flowers arranged in long drooping clusters. All flowers can open at the same time or after another, depending on the species. Wisteria blooms during the spring and summer. Flowers of some wisteria emit grape-like smell. Bees and hummingbirds are responsible for the pollination of these plants. Fruit of wisteria is pale green to light brown, velvety seed pod with one to six seeds. Ripe fruit explodes and ejects seeds away from the mother plant. Butter also plays a role in the dispersal of seed in the wild. Wisteria also propagates by a seed, hardwood, and softwood cuttings and layering. Wisteria produces poisonous seed, but flowers of some species can be used in human diet for manufacture of wine. All parts of Chinese wisteria contain toxic substances. Ingestion of the smallest piece of Chinese wisteria induces nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea in humans. Wisteria is often cultivated on the porches and walls and arches and fences. They can also be cultivated in the form of bonsai. Wisteria is rarely cultivated from seed because it reaches maturity in late life and starts to produce flowers 6 to 10 years after sowing. Chinese wisteria is classified as an intensive weed because of its aggressive nature and ability to quickly kill the host. It twines around the stem, cuts through the bark, and chokes the host to death. When it grows from the forest floor, Chinese wisteria forms dense thicket which prevent the growth of native plant species. 
Due to this fact, people apply various mechanical and chemical methods to eradicate Chinese wisteria from occupied areas. In the language of flowers, wisteria signifies overpassionate love or obsession. Wisteria is a perennial plant that can survive from 50 to 100 years in the wild. Wow, these plants are very, very beautiful. And I can see why they're grown for ornamental purposes. I think they make whatever they're on or whether they're growing from look very pretty. So what do you think of the Wisteria Discovery Learners? Go ahead and let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. And now for the word of the day. Today's word is constructive. It's an adjective. It means helping to improve, promoting further development or advancement, as opposed to destructive, constructive. Our next word is a word you may have heard somewhere in today's episode. That word is parity. It's a noun. It means equality as in amount, status, or character. Equivalence, correspondence, similarity, parity. Hola, Discovery Learners. So yo, tu maestra Liz. Hello, Discovery Learners. It is I, your teacher Liz. And, este es tu español, la palabra de la semana. What that means is, here's your Spanish word of the week. La palabra para esta semana es pantalón, 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 which means pants, pantalón, pants, pantalón. You could also use this word in a phrase. You could say, ponte las pantalones, ponte las pantalones, ponte las pantalones, which means Put on your pants. <laughs> Put on your pants. Ponte las pantalones. Put on your pants. Ponte las pantalones. Put on your pants. Try speaking Spanish all week long by saying, Ponte las pantalones, which means, Put on your pants. Hasta la semana que viene, Discovery Learners. Be sure to tune in next Monday to learn another Spanish word of the week right here on Ability to Learn. Hey, Discovery Learners, it's me, Andrew Lancaster, with a new list of movies to watch this week. And since we're learning about Japan, let's start off with The Isle of Dogs. This PG-13 film from 2018 is a comedy stop-motion animation with a 1 hour and 45 minute runtime. It stars Jeff Goldblum, Bill Murray, Brian Cranston, and Edward Norton, and so many others. If you want to find out the full list of stars, you can look for the movie on Disney+. Plus. With March Madness right around the corner, let's take a look at this classic, Space Jam. This PG film from 1996 is an animated comedy with a 1 hour and 40 minute runtime. It stars Michael Jordan as himself and Billy West as Bugs Bunny. If you're looking for this classic, look no further than YouTube or DVD. Keeping things courtside, let's take a look at Airbud. This PG film from 1997 is a family comedy with a 1 hour and 38 minute runtime and can also be found on YouTube or DVD. Bringing us back to Japan, let's take a look at a Studio Ghibli film, My Neighbor Totoro. This G film was made in 1988. It's a fantasy film and it has a 1 hour and 28 minute runtime and can be found on HBO Max. Let's take a deeper look at this cinematic work of art. This week's cinematic work of art is a Disney classic, Robin Hood, rated G from 1973. This adventure film has a 1 hour and 23 minute runtime. It was directed by Wolfgang Reitherman. The featured song is The Whistle Stop. The music was done by George Burns. It starred Phil Harris as Little John, Brian Bedford as Robin. Robin Hood is my favorite Disney film. I remember wanting to walk with Robin and his merry men through Sherwood Forest. 
This animated classic boasts some of the greatest voice actors in history, and they managed to make this story a classic for generations in the past all the way up to now. The timeless animation of this film was used in amazing fashion, using tricks and techniques with most of the animation being hand drawn. The music still gets stuck in my head when I hum a tune all day long. Few movies can say the art was hand drawn and painted and sung by a great musician like Roger Miller. This is a timeless classic and the artwork is still relevant today, making this Disney classic a true work of art. Robin Hood can be found on Disney Plus. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know that origami, you know that art of paper folding? Well, the smallest origami crane was made out of 0.1 millimeter by 0.1 millimeter size paper created by Mr. Nieto of Japan. Wow, that's super and extremely tiny. On that note, the biggest origami crane was 215 feet wide and was made a part of the World Peace Project for children. Oh my goodness, that is huge. 215 feet? That is big. So yeah, origami, that art form of paper folding, can be made really small and really big. Pretty interesting, huh? Aw, we all know what that song means. It means we reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun, and I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you're notified for all the fun here on Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day Program. This is Teacher Liz signing out. Farewell, Discovery Learners. I will see you next time. <laughs>